ومن أحسن قولا ممن دعا إلى الله وعمل صالحا وقال إنني من المسلمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن وله ما بعد so we are well aware that one of the biggest issues of consternation, of controversy uh, between the American Muslim community, frankly the Western Muslim community, is the issue of purchasing a house and the mechanisms for doing so, whether one is allowed to avail oneself to the conventional mortgages or whether it is permissible to go to the Islamic uh, bankings or is it even Islamic, these particular uh, banking uh, systems that are out there, the various uh, enterprises that are giving these Islamic mortgages, are they truly Islamic and halal or not? And I've been bombarded as all of the students of knowledge and scholars have been for so long and I've been delaying giving a full and detailed response and today inshallah ta'ala we will begin uh, with a very deep and intensive dialogue and I have uh, with me, joining me today, uh, somebody whom uh, I consider to be not just a friend but a mentor, and that is Dr. Hatim Al Hajj. Dr. Hatim Al Hajj, uh, before I, I, I uh, uh, ask him to speak, I have to introduce him, uh, and I'm sorry to be a little bit praising here, so maybe Dr. Hatim, you can put some uh, uh, some earplugs on, inshallah ta'ala. But I consider Dr. Hatim uh, Al Hajj to be uh, one of the marjirs, one of the, the sources of uh, Islamic uh, law and fatawa in this country. And uh, on a personal note when I myself am wondering about something, I want to bounce ideas off of somebody, when I don't really know uh, myself which direction to go about a fiqh issue or something, then the first person that I text is actually uh, Dr. Hatim Al Hajj. And of course Dr. Hatim Al Hajj isn't just uh, a sheikh or an alim, he's also board certified uh, in, the pediat in pediatrics by the American Board of Pedi Pediatrics, so he's a practicing doctor as well. He has a PhD in comparative fiqh from uh, Lebanon, from Al Jinan University, and he's also done an MA uh, in Sharia from the American Open University, and he's a professor, assistant professor uh, in this uh, department of uh, the College of Islamic Studies at Mishka University. And of course, he's also uh, one of the pillars of AMJA, the American Muslim Jurist Association, and so I welcome Dr. Hatim Al Hajj. Salam uh, alaikum, Sheikhana. Rafiqum alaikum, Salam alaikum. As for the introduction, I, I don't deserve it, and it is, you know, out of your humbleness, Jazakallah khairan. But uh, you know, I, I just wanted to say that I don't deserve it. Uh, inshallah, we will have a fruitful discussion today. This is a very complicated issue. And I will not hide uh, also my reluctance to talk about this subject because it's, uh, and, and I know of so many scholars throughout the Muslim world that are extremely reluctant to talk about this subject uh, because uh, as you uh, are well aware, it's very complicated, um, the distance between uh, the reality and what we aspire to seems to be a, a like large, uh, the, the, and uh, we're trying as much as we can. We're trying not to be cynical, uh, but we're trying also not to be naive. And that balance is very hard to strike. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide our tongues and our hearts. Uh, so, uh, Sheikh you know, one of the, the reasons, I'll be honest, that I've been very hesitant to uh, speak about this issue, and anybody who's asked me, you know, for the last few years, I keep on saying, inshallah, I'll release something soon is that uh, I feel that this is a very sensitive topic and anybody who gives a fatwa is gonna have to bear the responsibility of that fatwa. And it is something that I've been very uh, cautious about. As you yourself were saying, this is a very, uh, very big issue. It's not a trivial matter. And one is just cognizant of the difficulties, as you said, uh, between balancing between the needs of the Muslim community and between the great sin of interest. And it's a, not a very, easy and delicate uh, balance. So uh, I completely share with you the, the sentiment of uh, the seriousness of this matter. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide all of us to that which is pleasing and to forgive any uh, mistake that we might uh, make. So Sheikhana, before we jump into the issue of mortgages and whatnot, do you have any overall uh, comment about uh, the modern field of Islamic finance? I know it is one of your specialities. So overall, what, what do, do you have anything you'd like to say about uh, the, the new field of Islamic finance? Alhamdulillah. Well, uh, 
The name itself, Islamic finance, I, I guess if we're talking about providing funds for business ventures, then yes, Islam, Islamic finance would not be oxymoronic in, the, in this case because uh, we have the Mudaraba, which is profit sharing. We have uh, different part, uh, kinds of partnership like INAN, like full rain partnership and other uh, types of partnership uh, that were meant to, to provide funds for business ventures. Uh, but it, when it comes to providing funds for uh, a purchase of an item for use or consumption, uh, like a house, a car, etc., uh, then the, the, I, the, the name itself, the tension within the name is quite obvious, uh, because providing funds for someone to purchase a, an item, an object for use or consumption, uh, is a, in, in Islam is a benevolent uh, act. Uh, it's called the part uh, Hasan. It's a goodly loan, uh, and uh, it is, the no no profit is expected to be made out of this. Uh, but nowadays, uh, it is not uh, possible basically to fulfill the needs of all the people uh, because of how the world has become, because the expectations and the needs. And I, I don't want to be harsh on the people also and make it all about expectations or extravagance. There, there are needs uh, that need to be fulfilled and we live within a financial system, a global financial system that is insensitive uh, to and inconsiderate of our values. Not because they have to, not because there is cons conspiracy or not because they're like, just like evil and they, they, they want uh, basically to oppose our values, but because they, they just not don't share our values. Uh, and uh, we, we don't have the size of uh, Islamic finance, uh, it, uh, you know, in 2010, uh, it was worth about $1.3 trillion. That may sound like a, a, a big number, but it is actually not that big. Uh, I heard that this is half of what a conventional bank, you know, one of the largest conventional banks would, would be worth uh, just one bank. Uh, so it, 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 the, the idea here is we are, uh, Islamic finance is trying basically to instrumentalize some of the old uh, contracts that we had uh, in a completely new uh, environment and uh, within a, a, a global financial system that is not particularly uh, accommodating of, uh, of our laws or our values. So that's the, that's the difficulty. Um, and, you know, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, uh, to, to make it easy for the people who embark on this task, embark on the task of uh, you know, adapting uh, these contracts to uh, modern finance. I mean, so uh, Sheikh Nav, for our viewers, again, just a very, um, you know, brief, uh, uh, b basic point of fiqh is that in our Sharia, giving somebody a loan is never meant to generate profit. In fact, in the authentic hadith in the Sunan, our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that whoever gives somebody a qard hasana, a loan, uh, shall get half of that uh, money as a reward of giving sadaqah. So if you gave 10,000 loan and you got 10,000 back, Allah will reward you 5,000 as if you gave sadaqah to somebody. So this is the purpose is that in Islamic Sharia, in fiqh, giving somebody qard hasana, that's why it's called qard hasana, a good loan. It's a, a loan from the heart. You give somebody something that is a genuine good deed. You expect Allah to reward you. Obviously, the modern notion of capitalism, of the entire globe of finance, it is not based on this principle. And so Islamic finance specifically, and really Islamic economics, modern Islamic economics, it's actually a fascinating field. Uh, and, uh, you know, as uh, the Sheikh said, Annie, we really should be, feel sympathetic for the people involved. They're trying to make the best of a very, very different paradigm. The Sharia and its paradigm is so different than the modern uh, notions of the bank and of giving uh, usurious loans. And of course, Muslims, all of us are connected to the modern world. We cannot live in an isolated bubble. So we have to make the best of a very difficult situation. Uh, so with that, uh, Sheikhana, um, why don't I ask you uh, 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 the, uh, the, the set, setting up the entire stage here is that can you explain to us uh, the Islamic notion of riba 
and very briefly, is the Western notion of interest the same or different than the Islamic notion of riba? Okay, um, from the law, well, the, 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 you know, uh, interest is more general than riba in a sense, and riba is more general than interest in a sense. So uh, riba uh, linguistically means increase. And in Islam, there are like three different types of riba. Uh, so we have riba nasi'a, which is deferment, and we have riba liyad, which is exchange, the riba of exchange, and I may, you know, uh, uh, clarify what this means. And then we have riba al-fadl, which is the riba of increase. Uh, or you may say that we have like riba al qurud which is the riba of loans, and riba al buyu' which is the riba of sales. Uh, riba al qurud is basically when you give a loan and you expect a, a, a return on uh, this loan, like a profit, to be made uh, uh, when you are paid back. Uh, that is basically riba al qurud. It is the increase of uh, the uh, increase that is uh, a, a result of the deferment. Of, uh, of the payment. And in, in riba al biwa it's, it's completely different. And that's why the, the concept of riba is much larger than simply interest, because interest will accrue on the loan due to the deferment. That is riba nasiya or riba of deferment. But then we have the, the concept of riba al biwa which is riba of, in sales. And riba in sales results from uh, exchanging two items that are usurious items. They were mentioned in one hadith, the hadith of Abad ibn al-Samit, where the Prophet ﷺ mentioned gold, silver, wheat, barley, dates, and salt. He mentioned six items, and uh, he said, the, you know, and, and the, the hadith is long, but the Prophet ﷺ said, الذهب بالذهب والفضة بالفضة والبر بالبر والشعير بالشعير والتمر بالتمر والملح بالملح مثلا بمثل سواء بسواء فإن اختلفت هذه الأصناف فبيعوا كيف ما شئتم إن كان يدا بيد فمن زاد أو ازداد فقد أربى. So the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said that you know these items when when gold is paid for by gold, uh, silver for silver, um, wheat for wheat, barley for barley, uh, dates for dates, and salt for salt uh, has to be uh, like for like, equal for equal. Uh, and if you know, uh, and, and and if they are of different kinds, then uh, you could you could sell as as much as you want, like with an increase in the amount, as long as it is hand to hand uh, or immediate exchange. Um, and then whoever offers an increase or asks for an increase uh, has committed riba. Now. So, so we have two different types here of riba that uh, are uh, basically implied in this hadith. One of them is riba al-fadl, which is increase. So when you trade, for instance, wheat for wheat, it has to be like for like, equal for equal, hand to hand. When you treat wheat for barley, it does not have to be equal for equal, but it has to be hand to hand, immediate exchange. When you trade, well, when you trade, I'm sorry, when you trade uh, gold for silver or silver for uh, gold, uh, they don't have to be equal for equal, but they have to be hand to hand. To hand. And then uh, gold and uh, wheat, they don't have to be either. Uh, so there could be deferment, there could be increase because they belong to two different groups. Uh, so riba in that sense, is, is a very complicated matter. It is not only uh, interest that accrues on a loan because of the deferment, which is the common uh, form of riba that comes to mind when riba is mentioned, but there is a whole genre of riba buyu or riba of sales uh, that, that is divided into two types, fadl, which is increase, and exchange, which is yad, the riba yad. So riba is uh, much more general than interest. But uh, in a sense, when people talk about interest, 
when people when we uh, when when people translate treba to usury, usury also is is, is a problematic translation mm -hmm. because usury uh, is exorbitant interest. Reba is not only exorbitant interest. Reba is any interest, but any interest that accrues on a loan, any interest that accrues on a loan. But if I sell you, if you ask, uh, if if you ask me for my laptop, and I sell you my laptop uh, for like let's say five hundred dollars, and you say I don't have the money. Um, um, uh, can we defer the payment until next month? And then I tell you, okay, if you will pay me next month, or if you will pay me installments over three or four or six months, then it is not $500. I will sell you the laptop for $700 to be paid over six months. Is that interest? Well, some people could say that I added interest. But now I, this is a commodity for price, and I am not basically, this is not a loan. This is a sale. So can I add the uh, time value to the price in a sale? Yes. Can I calculate, if I, if I calculate this, uh, uh, you know, on the basis of some formula, uh, in my mind, let us say 7%, you know, at a rate of 7%, and I, I even tell you how I calculated it. That is called the interest, but that is not haram, that is not ribbon. I am selling you a, my laptop, and I am adding the time value, not in a loan transaction, but in a sale transaction. Uh, as long as we agree on one final version of the contract, certainly we cannot keep it open-ended where I tell you the price is 500 now with a 7% interest. So if you pay over one year, it is this, or two years, it's that. Like if we finalize the contract and we have one form of contract now, uh, the laptop will be for 700 over six months. Uh, regardless of how I arrived at this uh, number, and regardless of whether I will tell you how I arrived or not, this is a permissible transaction, and it is not usurious. So uh, to continue with uh, Sheikh uh, basically what can be said here is that riba, the Islamic term, is broader, generally speaking, than the Western notion of interest because of a debt. And uh, in our Sharia, there is a hadith in Darqutni. It is a weak hadith, but the concept is, is there. Uh, it is reported that the Prophet said, but it is a weak hadith, his most likely similar of a companion, that Kullu qardin fa'atan fahu riba. Every single loan that generates any type, of, uh, uh, any type of benefit, it is considered to be riba. So when you stipulate in a loan that you're going to get a benefit from that loan, the majority of our scholars would consider that to be a type of riba. Therefore, the interest that uh, you know we uh, people in this uh, in this part of the world charge when they give a loan, uh, that is definitely a type of riba by the explicit text of the hadith. And before I move on as well, I'd like to point out that there is no question that riba is one of the major sins in our religion. Allah Azza wa Jal explicitly mentions in the Quran that whoever takes riba, it is as if he is declaring war against Allah and His Messenger. That having been said, we need to be a little bit careful and accurate. There is a genre of uh, hadith that seems to equate uh, riba with a'udhu billah, yani doing zina with uh, one's maharim or with one's sister or mother, a'udhu billah. And these are hadith, it is true that some of our uh, later scholars consider them to be hasan, but uh, the reality is that the majority of our scholars, including the uh, the ones that are really more reputable in, in this field, uh, Ibn al-Qayyim, um, Ibn al-Jawzi and his mawdu'at, Ibn Abi Hatim, they all said that any of these narrations that seem to link uh, the sins of riba with doing zina with one of your mahrams, uh, all of this is from uh, the, uh, the the basically the. Uh uh, the uh, storytellers. It's not from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We don't need that genre of hadith. We have enough to tell us that uh, riba is a very, very major sin. The next question, Shaykhana, is that if you look at the text of the Quran, Allah Azza wa Jal always criticizes yaqulun riba those that are eating uh, riba. And uh, in some of the madhabs, as you're aware, uh, there is this distinction made between the sin of 
uh, charging interest versus the sin of paying interest. And so some madhabs and some scholars, they differentiate and they say that the sin of charging is more than the sin of having be, being forced to pay. As well in the hadith in uh, Sahih Muslim and others that uh, our Prophet ﷺ said that the one who gives it and the one who takes it and the one who witnesses and the, and the one who uh, writes the contract, they're all the same. So what is, uh, how do we understand this, Shaykhana? Is the sin of charging interest always the same as the sin of being forced to, to pay it? I also concur with you on the uh, genre of a hadith that talk about uh, that uh, actually not only equate riba to zina, but uh, make riba worse than 36 acts of zina or, you know, making zina with one's um, uh, mother. Uh, I used to actually, uh, I, I uh, used to sort of uh, accept the, 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 the one of the, one version of, of these hadiths because of the authentication of Sheikh al-Bani, but uh, then uh, I, had, I had a lot of difficulty justifying the, the hadith, the, the meaning of the hadith to myself, and I just was forcing myself to accept it, and I was trying to figure out using sort of like all my, like my sort of mental capacity to justify it somehow. But then, as you said, most of the scholars, most of the erudite hadith scholars have uh, consider the, the whole uh, genre of a hadith uh, in this regard uh, weak, uh, not traceable to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, uh, then you have the hadith of uh, Jabir in Sahih Muslim that you uh, mentioned, where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, said, you know, Allahu Akbar, riba wa mukilahu wa shahidayhi wa katibahu qalahum sawa. May Allah curse the, the, the one who devours riba or consume, and the one who feeds them, and the one who takes it, gives it, and the one who takes it, and the two scribes, uh, or the two witnesses and the scribe. And he said that they are uh, equal. Uh, I, I believe that, you know, I believe in the position of the scholars who said that they are equal in uh, being partners in crime, in, in a sense, so that uh, had they not all done this, like had, you know, they not helped each other doing this, the, gr the crime needed all of those uh, sort of uh, members. Uh, but uh, that is why they are equal, because they, uh, their participation in this crime was needed for the crime to be uh, committed. Uh, some of the scholars also said they are equal in the sense that they are equal in asl al-ism la miqdara, la miqdara al-ism. So they are equal in, in, in being sinful, not in the magnitude of the sin. So in other words, they're, they're all sinful. That's what the Prophet Sallallahu meant to say, not equally sinful uh, in the sense of uh, the magnitude of uh, the sin itself. Uh, some would say that sometimes the Prophet ﷺ would talk about the reward of, you know, uh, if, if you believe that this is also uh, an authentic tradition, if you be, uh, the, the reward of staying in the masjid after Salat al-Subh, for instance, until the sun rises and then you pray to rakahs, uh, so you have the reward of a hajj and umrah, tamma, 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 complete hajj and umrah. And, and, uh, so it, it is a little bit difficult, you know, like because Hajj and Umrah, there is so much that you do, and we know the reward of Hajj and Umrah, and you know, know the. Uh, uh, so some people may say that it is to encourage people, and some people may say that no, we will take it, as the Prophet Wasallam said, but in Hajj and Umrah, there is so much more you do than the basic reward of Hajj and Umrah, so ultimately it is not going to be the same. And certainly the exploiter and the exploited, if ex the exploitation of people is one of the major illas or the major causes of the prohibition of riba or wisdoms of the prohibition of riba, you cannot um, hold equal the exploiter and the exploited. Uh, there's got to be a difference in sin. Precisely. Precisely. Zakmullah Khair Shaykh. And you know, I remember uh, when you were speaking, it reminded me uh, something that I heard from our Shaykh Ibn Uthameen, Allah Yarhamu. Uh, he said to us in one of his lessons, he, he complained of the, and this is back in the 90s, um, he complained of the 
rising trend of vahiri, of vahiri, of vahirism, of a literalism, that you just take a hadith and you don't really understand the fiqh behind it. And he decried this new trend that was, uh, uh, you know, arising in that time frame. And uh, as you pointed out, Shaykhana, this hadith, uh, generally speaking, pretty much, you know, the majority of the shurah and the fuqaha, they have understood it in a manner, as you correctly pointed out, that there is no way that the one who charges interest, dhulman wa udwanan, wanting to increase his wealth, there is no way that the sin of that person is going to be the same technically as the sin of the one who is, you know, in a very difficult situation in dire circumstances or even in a haraj, not necessarily a darura as we're going to come to, and he's kind of, you know, forced because of the, the lifestyle or the the pressures of the world that he's living in to you know give uh, an, an amount of interest they cannot be the same based upon many other principles of the sharia so we don't just find one hadith and then use it to trump all the verses and all of the other hadith rather we form a narrative that takes everything into account and the fact that for example the quran always criticizes those who eat riba and also that we have other hadith la darar wa la darar and other um, uh, notions of this nature so it is definitely um, uh, you know safe to say that uh, a person who might be uh, forced to give riba because of certain circumstances, may Allah you know, protect and forgive all of us, uh, that there is no way that that sin would be, the, if it is even a sin, would be anywhere near the sin uh, of the one who is willingly, for no reason other than greed, charging uh, riba on a loan that he gives uh, somebody. So, uh, Shaykhana, the next question that I have for you is that, as you're aware, uh, there are some voices in our times that claim that the conventional mortgage, the standard mortgage that is practiced, that is, uh, you know, uh, people avail themselves to in America, that it does not constitute a type of Islamic riba. And they have their reasons for saying so, that the bank owns it, it doesn't give an actual, uh, that it's not an actual riba loan. And they have their reasons for, for saying so. Uh, what is your position? Is a mortgage uh, an example of Islamic riba? Uh, the mortgage is certainly an example of ex Islamic riba. Uh, uh, what what happens in a conventional mortgage is that the the, the bank gives you uh, uh, the money uh, to purchase the house and uh, gets back more over time. That's exactly you know that's riba. Uh, there is no uh, merchandise here at all that the bank acquires and sells to you. Uh, it is basically exchanging money for money uh, with deferment in re uh, exchange for an increase uh, or a profit on the invest uh, return on the investment. So that's that's riba uh, from the Islamic perspective. And I am aware of the scholars who um, are trying to say that basically, you know, because you have it, it is not. Uh, one group of scholars saying the same thing. You have different groups, and some of them uh, are saying that you know uh, to deposit money in the bank is not riba because the, ba the, the the banking system is so advanced, and they have their own calculations, and they invest this money, and because they are capable of uh, forecasting the profit that they will make, they can tell you exactly how much uh, profit you will be making, and, and so on and so forth. But there is another group of scholars who are actually trying to go back all the way and deconstruct uh, the notion of riba in modern times, particularly after Nixon, un uh, Nixon unlinked uh, the currency, the American currency, which is the mass mm -hmm. currency in the world, from the gold reserve and abandoned the gold standard, which started from the time of Roosevelt, but was completed by Nixon, was started during the, the Great Depression. And now the currency is unlinked uh, to the gold reserve. And so some of the scholars are saying, you know, what uh, proof do you have that uh, basically uh, the dollars and sterling pounds and euros are usurious uh, items? Um, are you likening them to gold and silver? Why are you likening them to gold and silver? And then we start getting into technicalities. And there are three different, you know, even when it comes to Islamic financing, even if it comes when, when, when you're trying to provide an Islamic product, there is a, uh, a genuine, uh, genuine solutions, genuine alternatives, 
that are philosophically different uh, and ideologically different from the con con conventional products. And there are um, technical differences. You're trying to provide a product that is technically different, but functionally the same. Or you're basically not even trying to provide a product that's technically different, but you are trying to rhetorically uh, basically convince the masses that your product is actually uh, Sharia compliant without it even being technically different uh, from uh, the, 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 the products that we have on the market or the conventional products. Uh, the, the, the same uh, we can say about the scholars that are trying to basically say that there is no riba anymore, uh, unless, unless it is gold for gold. Uh, but there is basically no riba anymore. And in this case, you could say, well, the, you know, the illa of riba or the cause behind uh, the prohibition and uh, exchanging gold for gold and gold for silver and so on and so forth is that they are measured by weight. And that would be the Hanafi and Hanbali position. Um, but, but according to the Malikis and Shafi'is, the, 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 the reason behind uh, you know, the prohibition of riba and gold and silver is that they are currencies as, as man. If here, here, the problem here is that if you actually uh, say, well, I'm Hanafi or Hanbari, and I believe that the reason behind the prohibition is weight, uh, then we will be circumventing the objectives of Sharia with technicalities. Mm -hmm. Technic you know, and the technicality here is not simply sly maneuvering or deceptive uh, legal devices, you're actually talking about two mazahib out of four, but it's still a technicality because if you look at it functionally, philosophically, mm -hmm. it, then we will not have riba anymore. And then we will create problems for zakat as well. Exactly. It's limited to riba. If you're mm -hmm. not, you're going to be saying that dollars and pounds and euros and reals and so on cannot be likened to uh, to gold and silver, then you're not going to only uh, we're not going to only have problems in in the chapters of riba, but we will also be having a lot of problems in zakat as well. Precisely. So, Sheikhana, we are in full agreement then that those small minority of voices, with utmost respect to them, who claim that mortgages are simply not even an example of riba, that they really don't seem to be coming from a, a solid background. And we both agree that the conventional mortgage is in fact a type of riba. Now, let's now get to the, 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 the juicy stuff here. We agree that the mortgage uh, loan is a type of riba loan. The question arises, under what circumstances would this be permissible? We are all aware, Sheikhana, that for the last 30 years, or more, there has been an ongoing debate amongst uh, our scholarly class, uh, one side of which allows a conventional mortgage with uh, a, a list of reasonable conditions. It must be the house that you live in. You cannot afford you know, the alternatives, meaning you cannot just purchase the house by cash. Uh, you don't do this for business. And of course, you have some very, very well-respected jurists. You know, the Sheikh uh, and Qardabi is, of course, the most famous example, but it's not just him. I mean, the European Council for Fatwa and Research in 1999 by a large, uh, majority, if not unanimous, I forgot, they voted. Uh, they also gave a fatwa in this regard. Uh, the number of scholars that say that a conventional mortgage, just straight up from the bank, if you're living in the West and, it, and you're middle class, basically you're not a millionaire, you can't just afford it by, a, by one check or so, whatnot, that they say that it is a type of, of uh, need, not a type of darura or necessity, but a type of need. And they have their illas without getting into the, the reasons and the causes, because again, that's a bit too advanced for our um, you know, a conversation here. But just without getting into all of the details of why they're saying this, what is your frank assessment, your own personal opinion, that is it permissible for the Muslim living in the West to obtain a conventional mortgage? And also, what is your advice to the lay Muslim when he sees, you know, Sheikh Qardawi and these great ulama on one side and then on the other side also great ulama? So part A and part B, if you want to follow the Sheikh. Tafadl Sheikh. Well, part A is, is, is easy because uh, I would have to say two things, you know. Uh, I, I'm a member of AMJA and at AMJA we, you know, our position on this issue uh, is, is clear that uh, conventional mortgage is not 
permissible except in the case of darura and not haja. Except in the case of darura and not haja. And, and so, um, you know, the, the, the esteemed scholars of the European Council, they, they, they felt that there is a haja and they felt that there is like a haja amma and they uh, basically allowed uh, conventional mortgage, uh, but they allowed it if there is no Islamic alternative. And since we have somewhat, uh, you know, an Islamic alternative now, uh, then we all uh, are in agreement that you should first seek the Islamic alternative uh, that that is available for people in the U.S. and uh, in Europe as well. Uh, so that the, at the time they allowed this, there was no Islamic alternative. Um, and they, uh, I do remember that they clearly stated that as long as there is no Islamic alternative, then it would be allowable for people to, uh, to obtain a conventional mortgage. I would say that, it, let us uh, basically say that this will, should be addressed on one by one basis. Uh, the, uh, the person who uh, does not have access to an Islamic mortgage and feels that he has some type of tarura or haja, uh, that he needs to ask a scholar about this and then go by uh, their fatwa. As for part B, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know that the the, the um, it's it's a compl it's a complicated question. I would just say that the the two important pieces of advice here are one. Uh, Imam Shafai said, "Ajma al Muslimuna and Nahum and Istabana, Man Istabana Tlahu Sunnat Rasulullah Sallam Nabi Yaqul 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 uh, you may not be able to understand the rationale behind the fatwas of the scholars, but when it is clear to you that the intent of Allah and his messenger is to prohibit or to allow something, then the statement of a scholar will not save you. If, it, if you feel in your heart that you're quite confident that this is what Allah and his messenger had wanted of you. The second thing is the hadith of Wabis ibn Ma'bad, which is safti qalbak, uh, so consult your heart when you know the Prophet said to Abisa, consult your heart. Righteousness is that with which you feel comfortable, or the heart feels tranquil and the soul feels comfortable, and ism or sin is what wavers in your chest and causes discomfort in your breast, um, regardless of how many fatwas or you know, regardless of how many times the people have given you their legal counsel or their fatwa. So that, uh, uh, having said this, uh, if, it is, if your heart feels uncomfortable, then I would tell you, uh, listen to your heart. And I would, I would say in general, I would say in general, one should try as much as they can to exercise wara, uh, you know, cautiousness, scrupulosity, religious scrupulosity, or being cautious, being careful. Uh, but when there is a particular, you know, issue that causes you hardship, when is, there is a particular matter, particular issue that causes you hardship, and you've got two different uh, opinions from two different scholars. One is easier and one is more difficult. Uh, and it is not clear to you what Allah had, what Allah wanted of you uh, in this particular respect. Uh, and you're, you, you know, there you just can't understand the, the rationale behind the two fatwas. It is okay to take the easier one. It is not saying that you're going to be doing this all the time. You're going to be scanning all the fiqh uh, you know, in the world and picking out all the easier fatal. But I'm saying that if you come across or encounter a matter that is causing you hardship and different fatal, you hear different fatawa and some are easier and some are harder, it is okay in this case uh, to take the easier fatal.
Jayid, so Sheikh to summarize then uh, that uh, the position of uh, Sheikh Qardawi and the European Council, we respect it and it is coming from a legitimate paradigm. We are not dismissing it at all. It is a legitimate fatwa. However, uh, I think the both of us are in a very similar wavelength that we don't endorse that fatwa unconditionally. Rather, only if there is no alternative and if the person's circumstances are specifically in a pretty difficult situation, perhaps in that particular exceptional scenario, but as a default, as a norm, uh, the both of us are very hesitant to open this door. Uh, Sheikh, I want to add here though, um, one of my, my dear mentors as well, and um, I mentioned his name because his YouTube clip went viral, uh, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people saw it. A few months ago, he released a, qu a short video about mortgages, Dr. Akram Nadwi, I'm sure you're aware of him, and a great alim and sheikh. And he said that uh, when it comes to food and drink, the haram will never become halal unless it is darura, life and death. However, he said, when it comes to finances and financial matters, he says, generally speaking, the haram becomes halal not at the level of darura, but at the level of haja or a general need. Now, for our viewers in Islamic law, matters are divided into uh, daruriyat and haj, uh, hajat and tahsiniyat. And so, darura is like you need it, you're, you're, or else you're going to die. Food, water, drink, air. Haja. It's something that makes life, you know, livable. If you don't have it, you're not going to die, but it just makes life very difficult. And then uh, tahsiniyat is, of course, yani something that makes life luxurious and nice, but you don't even need it. And his point was that, for example, uh, insurance, for example, car insurance, it's not darura, but it is a haja. You could get by. You're not going to die if you don't have car insurance, but it's a, a haja. And he gave other examples from the economic field as well. And then he said that most of our scholars understand this when it comes to most of the buyur transactions, that there's a haja, and so they'll overlook. Yet when it comes to mortgages, he says that the haja might even be even more so. For example, you want to have a house in the district that your children go to school to, and it's a good school. Or you want to get a house that is close to the masjid, or you want to get a house that is close to your parents, for example. That is a bigger haja than many of the other transactional hajat that many of our scholars allow, uh, you know, uh, they, they allow certain concessions for. So he was very clear in this regard, and he of course endorsed the European Council of Fatwa, that uh, the default ruling for them would be that the average Muslim in the West would be allowed to take a mortgage because he said it is a haja, and because of hajat are allowed to be, you're allowed some laxity when it comes to financial issues. Your, your comments and thoughts about this, Sheikh Hana? It, it is very complicated, and uh, certainly I respect uh, Sheikh Akram Nadwi a great deal. He's a great scholar. I, I just wanted to say that they're not all equal. Uh, you know, they're not created equal. Uh, different sins are different. Uh, uh, when it comes to insurance, uh, insur insurance is basically prohibited because of al-gharar. And al-gharar, which is speculation and risk taking due to uncertainty and ambiguity, is a, a genre of sins or uh, sort of Mukhalafat, mahzurat, uh, prohibited uh, transactions. The whole genre of these prohibited transactions, there are many exceptions in the Sharia where gharar has been allowed by the Sharia. Some degree of gharar has been allowed by the Sharia. Some degree of gharar has been allowed by the Sharia for uh, like needs, uh, for, for various needs. But when it comes to riba in particular, riba and gharar are not the same. So that is why Generally speaking, if, uh, if we're talking about the Qarar uh, or we're talking about a, a sort of a, a clauses in the contract that are not compliant, then certainly Haja and Larura, they, both will, they will both be operative here in, in making concessions, in making concessions. But when it comes to the clear cut riba, you know, when it comes to riba nasia, the, the agreed upon riba, the clear cut riba, uh, then this is where we say that it is only the darura and not the haja uh, that will allow concessions. Having said that, we, you know, I understand that there is like, you know, uh, that someone can argue about this. Someone can also say that uh, riba uh, is not prohibited uh, in and of itself. It is prohibited because of what, what it leads to. Uh, as mm -hmm. a 
to, to evil, not that it is evil in and of itself, but it is a means to evil. And why are you creating that difference between riba and the qarr? Someone can also say that the Prophet وسلم, allowed uh, some degree of riba in al araya which is basically to exchange uh, dried dates for ripe dates on the palm trees. And certainly there are different kinds of riba combined in this transaction. Mm -hmm. But he allowed it for a haja, not darura. The haja mm -hmm. here, people wanted to eat fresh dates. I mean, they have the dried dates. It's not like they're going mm -hmm. to die. But they wanted to eat fresh dates. So he recognized their need for fresh dates, and he allowed this. So I understand that there is like it is it is not completely cut and dry. But uh, but what what we're trying to say is that there has been uh, a uh, like close to a consensus of the contemporary Muslim scholars that riba is a category that is higher in prohibition. I mean, it's, it's quite obvious riba that the prohibition yes. of riba, and all of the arguments about riba are quite obvious. So they, they are saying that this is a category that is different from gharar or undue risk taking. That's why they have been a lot more permissive in things like insurance than they were in clear cut riba. Uh, so Allah, Allah knows best. Excellent. So, uh, so uh, once again, uh, once again, 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 so again, so once again the, 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 the fatwa, fatwa of our, of our dear sheikh as well. Definitely, definitely coming from a very solid, solid paradigm, paradigm. Definitely, definitely great usul, and you can make an argument, uh, but uh, as is clear, you respectfully disagree because of a very, uh, very technical point, which is actually not that technical. <laughs> it is just, uh, it is that the the gravity of the sin of riba is a totally different uh, caliber, if you like, than the other issues that the Sharia might have overlooked when it comes to other financial matters. So because of this, uh, you are not comfortable opening the door, and that's a very valid uh, paradigm. Taib Sheikh and, and now... Shaykh Yasser, I, I wanted also, Shaykh Yasser, if, if you don't yes. mind, I just wanted to say that many of the scholars are saying this because of a, a, a different concept, like the, there is another layer of complexity here, which is al-haj al am the public need, and that mm -hmm. is some scholars are being more permissive. And in Imam al Juwaini in the book Al Riyasi or Riyas al Umam, uh, he, he talks about this and he talks about, you know, let us say, you know, that, that you know, means the livelihood become so difficult, halal means the livelihood becomes so rare and scarce and difficult. That haram prevails on earth, uh, and then he said something that is very interesting. He said that you know, it, it is not far fetched to say that this is the case in our times, in wow. his fifth yeah. century. Uh, then it is not possible for us. It is not possible for for us. حَمْلُ النَّاسِ عَلَى النِّتْفَافِ عَنِ الْأَقْوَاتِ وَالتَّعْرِي عَنِ الْبِزَّةِ. It is not possible. For us, the demand of people to uh, basically uh, refrain from sustenance or to uh, abstain from sustaining themselves and uh, you know clothing themselves and so on and so forth. And then he continued, and this this is like a, you know he continued to talk about different examples where it will not be only for darura but for hajj, where the concessions will be made not only for darura but for hajat. And he mentions that if the Muslims limit themselves during those times, if the Muslims limit themselves to darurat, that will debilitate the ummah as, as an ummah. So that mm -hmm. is also another uh, reason why uh, I do not condemn the other fatawa. I just disagree with without condemnation because I do understand that there are different uh, you know, takes on, on this matter and I uh, respect all the scholars and their takes as long as they uh, use proper usul and proper methodology. Jazakumullah khair, Sheikh. And again, I'd like to underscore this point, yani what uh, Dr. Hatim said, especially for our viewers, is that all too often we find uh, some of our students, may Allah Azza wa Jal, you know, um, uh, guide them and grant them more wisdom. They are so overzealous in their remarks about great ulama, 
that they disagree with and they don't understand that in fact those ulama their usul are solid they wouldn't be ulama i mean if they had usul that are completely whacked out or far left field they're coming from a solid paradigm and actually you know if you listen to dr hatim carefully subhanallah what a generous spirit of dr hatim he actually gave more arguments even though he doesn't agree with it right and he's saying i see where they're coming from so this is the spirit that i wish all of us have is that utmost respect, I respectfully uh, disagree with uh, their fatawa. They have the paradigm correct, they have the usul valid, but it is a gray area and they are prioritizing certain things, we are prioritizing other things. So Alhamdulillah Dr. Hatim, we're exactly on the same wavelength here. We have three questions left, but these are the zubda and the khulasa now. So now, we've spoken about general mortgages. Let us get to the issue of the uh, Islamic mortgages. That is the conventional name that is given to them. And before I ask you uh, the question, let me set it up for our audience and viewers. A brief summary is, is warranted here that uh, the Islamic companies that offer uh, Sharia compliant loans, basically, I'm calling it an Islamic mortgage because that's some of the terms that is used, but it's called a Sharia compliant loan. There are a number of models that uh, uh, these companies use. Three of them are the most uh, famous. They're not the only, but these are the most uh, the most utilized. The first of them uh, is called the uh, murabaha, uh, with a promise to pay. And what that is is that, is that the the company buys the house and then sells you the house back in installments for a profit. Okay, so this is the murabaha ma'al wa'du bishra with a promise to pay. This is the first model that is used. The second model, which is perhaps the most common in North America, and that is al-musharaka al-mutanaqis al-muntahi bit-tamlik. That's a diminishing partnership that eventually ends with you owning the property. And in the second model, the uh, the Islamic company purchases the house along with you. You are both owning the house, and you enter into a partnership, and the 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 uh, percentage of ownership slowly diminishes as you keep on paying the monthly installment and you pay the same amount but a portion of that goes back to the loan and a portion of that goes to the rent and the proportion of loan versus rent it continues to change as the years go on until finally you have paid off the entire loan and the rent and then the house is yours so this is called the diminishing partnership model al musharaka al mutanaqisa and then the third model which is used by one or two companies here in North America, and that is the ijara rent to own. And that is when the uh, Islamic company, the, the Sharia compliant quote unquote company, that it'll ask you to get a conventional loan, and then it'll purchase the house off of the bank, and then resell it to you in installments along with a rental agreement. So these are the three main conceptual mechanisms. Number one, murabaha with the promise to buy. Uh, number two is the diminishing partnership. And number three, the ijara rent to own. For now, the question I want to ask you, Dr. Uh, Hatim, let's leave aside the real contracts that exist with these companies. Let's talk conceptually speaking. If we could have an ideal uh, contract that is murabaha with promise to buy number one number two the diminishing partnership and number three ijara rent to own what is your personal verdict conceptually speaking for an ideal contract in all of these three categories bismillah bismillah well, the, the ideal contract would be the murabaha uh, because it will be easy uh, you know, it, uh, the, 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 the problem was the murabaha. The idea contract is the murabaha if the Islamic mortgage company has all the resources it needs or all the funds it needs uh, to, yeah, you know, for, for all the Muslims and all the people, their customers, without needing to go to the secondary market and sell those contracts. You know, the, the problem with murabaha is uh, murabaha means cost plus sale. It is when you, uh, when, when it is called murabaha al amr bishra, as you said, it is basically cost plus sale uh, to the purchase order. I go and order you to purchase a property for me, and you add your markup and sell it back to me after you possess it. You add your markup and sell it back to me for a larger sum of money over many years so it's a simple uh a simple contract uh simple contract that once we have ensured that you actually bought and possessed the property you could turn around and sell it to me uh for a markup that you uh decide uh, then what 
I will owe you is a debt. Now, you give me three hundred thousand uh, dollars, and you give like many other people the you know five hundred thousand, eight hundred thousand, and so on and so forth. You run out of money unless you can take this contract and sell it in the secondary market to Freddie Mac, uh, Fannie Mae, or Freddie Mac, or somebody. Uh, you will not have funds to, uh, to, to, to give to any more clients. Then if you are, if you are Muslim, you have a problem at your hand here because it's, you can't sell debts. The sale of debts is impermissible in Islam. So murabaha is not doable if we're talking about Muslim companies and we do want to patronize Muslim companies and we do want to support them and so on because of this reason unless they have enough funds for everybody which you know i don't know if anyone has uh, so that is more the 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 uh, diminishing partnership the, the problem with diminishing partnership is that it is complicated because you will continue to be a partner for 30 years mm -hmm. and you have to live up to what that means you know you are a partner so you have to live up to the requirements of partnership and the rules of partnership in Islamic law. And that makes it complicated. To get out of all of this, uh, you will need to have many clauses in your contract that will be not compliant, or at least that you will have to put a lot of effort and so much patchwork to, to get them to comply, it, it will be pretty difficult uh, to Very get messy. all the clauses to comply. The same applies to the rental one. The same applies to the rental one. You will be the lessor and I will be the lessee, but as the financier, you are the lessor. And you are the lessor for how long? For 30 years. So oh. you have to live up to the rules of ijara in Islamic law. And that is also difficult because you will have to be responsible for periodical, you know, or they call it al like the same applies to the diminishing partnership in proportion, proportion to your uh, 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 assets. Uh, but, but, but the idea here is it is also problematic. Now you cannot, if those uh, contracts uh, bear all this risk, you cannot take them and sell them in the secondary market to uh, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. So in order for you to be able to do this, you will have to eliminate the risk as much as you can, as much mm -hmm. as you need to, to be able to sell them in the secondary market. And that elimination of risk goes against the uh, sort of the rules and the Sharia. So there are complications in all three the kinds of contracts. Uh, unless you have the political will and the economic capacity, not only the political will, because we are part, even in a Muslim country, in a Muslim majority mm -hmm. country, we're part of the global financial system. And it is hard without so much political will and economic power, both, you know, both of them, it is hard to have products that are truly compliant in essence, that are functionally Islamic, technically Islamic, and in every way Islamic. Uh, so so that's, the, that's the difficulty they, they, they encounter. So, Sheikh Anas, so again, to, to, to summarize then, what, uh, what you're saying is that ideally speaking, the murabaha would be the best, all three of them in an ideal world, if we had the finances and if we had, you know, the, the, the wherewithal, you could construct an Islamically permissible contract, no problems. But we get to the crux of the matter, and that is, realistically, it is simply not viable for any uh, corporation, for any entity to uh, manage many hundreds, if not thousands, you know, of properties and sell them uh, to so many Muslim clientele without getting involved in certain conditions, certain clauses that are highly problematic. And this is where, of course, the problem comes. And that is that conceptually speaking, these three models 
uh, yes, ideally it's possible to be 100% halal, but realistically, we know that when these corporations, when these uh, Sharia compliant, uh, co they call themselves Sharia compliant companies, when they ask you to sign their 30, 40 pages of, of documents, there are so many specific clauses in there that are highly problematic and questionable. And as uh, you pointed out, Dr. Dr. Hatim, they seem to be very unfairly uh, prejudiced against the buyer and in favor of the company, whether it is distribution of maintenance costs, whether it is taxes, whether it is even late fees, which is another issue. And so let's now get to the, the, the crux of the matter here. We understand these contracts do have problematic clauses, even if ideally the model might theoretically be halal. Do you think these problematic clauses invalidate the permissibility of the contract? I know that's a broad-ended question, so feel free to elaborate and give, uh, you know, give the caveats over here. Well, I, let, me t let me say this. Um, the idea here is that the, the old contracts that we have that are, that are established in the Sharia, you cannot really instrumentalize them in our modern times uh, to uh, provide uh, Islamic modes of financing, you will have to have new contracts. Each and every scholar recognizes that these are new contracts, no matter how much we give them Islamic names or names of established Islamic contracts or transactions, these are new contracts, they are not the old ones. And many scholars, uh, you know, and, and that is, uh, in most of the Muslim countries, they they they, uh, they take the fatwa of Imam Taymiyyah rahimahullah, where he, or, or the tarjih of Imam Taymiyyah, that new contracts can be uh, halalized, that, that you could have new contracts, you don't have to, have, you, you don't have to use established contracts in Islamic uh, fiqh, uh, but you could make new contracts as long as those new contracts are not uh, in conflict with the principles with the Islamic objectives and the principles of, uh, you know, Islamic transactions. So um, we, we do understand that these are new contracts. Now, these new contracts, in order for them to be halal, they need to meet certain guidelines. So in order for them to be halal and to provide a, uh, a functionally a different alternative, an alternative that is more equitable an alternative that will basically make Islamic finance shine and show, uh, you know, the transparency, the accountability, the equity, the social responsibility. Those are the characteristics of Islamic finance. However, Islamic finance in our times, even in Muslim majority countries, does not have that good reputation. You know, why? Because of different reasons. One because of the difficulties of creating uh, instruments like financial instruments within the global financial system that are compliant because the global financial system is expectedly not really considerate of our values and our laws. Uh, the, the second one is that banks do want to eliminate the risk, whether because they want to eliminate the risk to be able to sell their uh, contracts in a, a secondary market or they just want to eliminate the risk because they want to eliminate the risk, mm -hmm. even in Muslim majority countries. So there is a large distance between, you know, what you know what we aspire for and the reality. Uh, a, a large distance. Now, uh, or the cost plus uh, sale for the purchase order. The problems with this. Uh, there are so many problems in this that, that, that caused, you know, this to be, um, you know, not completely like compliant in its current forms. One is al-mu'a'ada, is basically the mutual binding promise. It is not the promise from by one entity, it is promised from both entities, which scholars consider it akin to a contract, although there are some differences, and I don't know how technical you want this to be, but like if, if we want to make it not too technical, then we, we're saying, let's just mention, you know, the, the, the major problems. One of the major problems is the mutual binding promise, uh, which is al-mu'a'ada, which is uh, to many scholars akin to a, a contract. I promise to buy, you know, I tell you buy this for me, and then I give you a binding contract to buy it from, uh, you for abiding promise to buy it from you, 
And uh, that binding promise, some people said it's the Maliki position. Many Malikis would argue that it is not. Uh, Malikis do not even accept you know, the, the Murabaha concept to begin with. The Malikis, many Malikis, many uh, contemporary Maliki scholars would consider uh, the binding promise in these transactions to not be uh, the, the, the proper Maliki position. And, uh, you know, the Malikis, uh, like uh, Sheikh al Qariyani, for instance, wrote extensively on this issue. Uh, Sheikh Sadiq al Qariyani, the Mufti of Libya. Um, now, this is just one of the problems, and we're talking about a binding promise from one side. We're not talking about a binding promise from both sides, which is even more problematic. Uh, but that is what happens, uh, that you have a binding promise from both sides. And then, uh, what is also uh, uh, unclear is whether the, the, the bank possesses the property or the institution, the, the financing institution or the bank possesses the property before they turn around and hand it over or, or pass it on to you. That position is important, ne is necessary for this transaction to be halal. Because al-kharaj bit-taman, as the Prophet wasallam said, <laughs> means that profit is tied to liability. If you do not become liable for the property, you know, money does not beget money. There has to be some risk, there has to be some labor, there has to be some reason to make profit. Otherwise, money should not beget money. So the bank or the institution should own the property and then sell it to you. Does this happen? You know, one institution wrote to uh, the office of the controller, uh, the office of the controller of currency, mm. and explained to them the murabaha type contract to convince them that there is no difference between it and between uh, the murabaha uh, contract and conventional mortgage, and to convince them because you know banks should not be involved in risky ventures risky inv investments. So the office of the controller of currency would not allow them to basically uh, be involved in a risky uh, investment or transaction. So the, the, at the bottom line is the office of the controller of currency told them that you have, that this is functionally like completely similar to uh, a conventional mortgage. And it is okay, it is fine, because they have eliminated the risk to a point where you could not, you could not recognize any functional difference, functional, not technical, because the contract may be technically, but you cannot recognize any functional difference between it and the conventional mortgage. So that is one, uh, basically, uh, instrument of uh, Islamic financing. Now, does it, does, it, does it make it different to be technically different? Yes, it makes it different. Here's, here's, the, here's the point that we have to agree uh, to disagree on. Some people say that we look so naive and we look so idiotic in front of all people that we are actually trying to, it is basically like setting up the net on Friday, uh, mm. and we're doing it, and we know that everybody knows that we're doing it to ourselves. How could we do this? The, the, the issue here is that you do not want to open the floodgates. You do not want to break that psychological partition between us and Reba. We want to try as much as we can, even if there are some technical differences. We want to try mm -hmm. as much as we can to have Excellent those point. differences. So we're not committing riba just like blatantly. A clear cut riba. You mm -hmm. know? So that's the point. So that's the first one. The second one that you mentioned is the diminishing partnership. And the diminishing partnership is the one that has been chosen by, you know, uh, like Muslims that you know, Muslims who want to get into this business, uh, they can't, as I said before, 
choose the murabaha, even though it may be easier, because as I said, after you, uh, after you uh, give the, the, the funds, you will run out of funds after like four or five customers or like 20 customers or 100 customers, you run out of funds. So you will need to basically uh, turn around and, and sell this contract to uh, Freddie Mac or Fannie Mae and so that you could finance uh, other customers. Mm -hmm. uh, you couldn't do this if you're Muslim with the murabaha uh, because you can't sell a debt. Uh, so the, the diminishing partnership becomes uh, the, the, became the favorite for uh, you know, the Muslims that were, like some of the Muslims that were pioneers in this industry. And I, I'm not saying that they did not put effort. They put effort. I'm not saying that there are no differences. There are differences. Are those differences functional differences? You know, sometimes maybe. You know, one of the functional differences in, in, Mura, in Murabaha, for instance, is that if the customer died, you know, in the one minute between, uh, you know, the tra transferring the, the, the funds to the seller and finalizing the contract between the financier and the final buyer, uh, if the customer died, then the bank may be, uh, you know, uh, yeah, so, but in the diminishing partnership, we do have differences, some functional differences, uh, but mainly it, these are technical differences, not functional differences, but some functional differences. If, for instance, the bank, uh, if, the, for instance, uh, you insured the house, but the house for some reason, God forbid, got totaled and the insurance company did not pay you uh, the value of the house. The, 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 that, the, the Muslim um, financier will not be after you for mm -hmm. uh, what they have given you, only mm -hmm. for their share in, you know, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in whatever payment that you will get, their fair share in the payment. Yes that you will get. If they now own 65% of the house, you'll get 65% of the payment that you will get from the insurance company. Is that a function of difference? It is. Honestly, it is. So, but then there are many technical differences and there are some technical problems also because according to the uh, IOFI standards, and that's the accounting and other thing, you know, for Islamic financing institutions, uh, so according to the Alfie standard, according to the different FIPI assembly standards, there are some rules that are so difficult to, uh, to uphold by, you know, uh, by those, uh, uh, you know, companies or by, uh, at least in, in non-Muslim majority countries, at least when the laws, maybe in Malaysia you could do that, maybe in, in you know, in some countries that are more accommodating of, Islamic financing, you could do that, but it is certainly very hard here in the U.S. Uh, and there are multiple ones, you know, they will ask you to be responsible for the insurance, they'll ask you to be responsible for all maintenance, even the basic uh, essential maintenance. Uh, they'll ask you to not sell the house for a certain number of years, and if you must uh, sell uh, prior to the end of the agreement, then you must buy them out first and then sell the house and so on and so forth. Many things that are, uh, and there's also some uh, mutual binding promise involved. There are many issues and then the future sale, um, whether it is by promise or contract, because when, when, when you do uh, uh, basically purchase the, the house and each one of you has a share, you will, either promise to buy um, a portion of the house every year until you completely buy them out, or you uh, agree on the sale. It is either a promise or a, an agreement. If it is an agreement, it's a little bit more problematic, but if it is binding promise from both sides, it is also somewhat uh, problematic. Mm -hmm. But that, that is, it is very difficult without this. If it is very difficult to leave it up to the customer to purchase at the market price on the day of purchase. So we will agree because then we cannot 
we cannot figure out how much uh, uh, the person will be paying. Uh, it, it, we will just, you know, it will be 20%, 80%. And then every year I will purchase a portion of the house uh, at the market price on the day uh, of sale. That is to do it in a way that is completely uh, compliant. But that, again, becomes very difficult. So are there clauses that are problematic? Are there maharij, outlets? Well, yes, because there are scholars that are working to find outlets. Does it take so much work? Does it take many opinions that are outside of the form of that? Have? Does it take a lot of patchwork? It does. But as we said, you know, what are our options? What are our options? We either say, um, you know, you, you don't need to buy houses, you don't need to buy cars, you don't need to buy equipment for business, you don't need to, to get into business ventures, or we say you must have completely compliant contracts which are extremely, extremely difficult, and that is not to discourage people from pursuing what is better and from improving incrementally, and we do say this all the time, to all the Muslim financiers. We do say this all the time to them and we encourage them to provide better products. But also we have to patronize them to, to become large enough to have the, the size so that they can dictate their terms. So that's the, 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 the managing partnership. And finally, we have the last one that, the, the, that you mentioned, mentioned, which is the Ijara. And it is, to a certain extent, like the diminishing partnership, I and mean, it's not like it, but, but the, 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 the same types of problems, that it is a commitment for 30 years where the financier is not going to wash his hands and walk away. The financier is the owner, is the lessor, and the, 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 the customer is simply the lessee. He's not responsible, you know, he's not liable, except in the cases of ta'addi or tafrit, negligence or mm. wrongdoing on his part, Islamically, because we will have to apply the rules of ijara uh, in Islam. Can this, that, that poses a lot of problems also, to become an instrument of financing, uh, and then you get the financier involved at this level, uh, it causes a, like a slew of problems. So, all of them have issues, but all of them show promise at least to be technically different from the conventional mortgages so that Muslims are not committing clear-cut riba, although the contracts may not be, you know, 100% Sharia compliant. It, now, the fact that we got the clear-cut riba out of the way makes it uh, easier on us to say that these uh, uh, basically contracts are halal to be party in these contracts. Are, it is halal to use them for your needs, your various needs. Uh, Amjad's position so far is that these contracts, because of the clauses that are not compliant, uh, Amja did not sign like a sort of like uh, sign on these contracts completely uh, without reservations. But these Amja said because of the uh, these clauses that are not completely compliant, these contracts are permissible for Hajj. If the mm -hmm. if you have a need, these contracts are permissible, and according to Amja. The, the, the declining ownership in its current application in America is the one that Amja favored uh, mm. in, in its declaration. Excellent. So, Sheikhana, uh, this is very, very useful. Uh, so, again, to summarize, uh, Mashali went into a lot of technical detail. Uh, the, to summarize, and again, if I said something correct, then, then uh, feel free to correct me. 
Uh, obviously, the way that these three contracts actually exist in the corporations in North America, we're speaking primarily, we don't know about Europe, we're not talking about Europe, but the ones in America, North America, uh, the ways that they exist, realistically, there are highly problematic clauses in all of these uh, contracts, even though the asl or the basis of the, of the theory is good, but because these corporations are ensuring or trying their best to ensure that there is minimal or no loss to them. So they put the onus of much of the burden uh, and they put so many clauses that the functionality of the contract is actually somewhat similar, not exactly similar uh, to uh, mortgages. However, they are not all the same and some of them are better than others. And uh, of those that are probably of the best in the North American scene are the companies that offer the diminishing partnership, the Musharaka al Mutanaqisa. Again, we're looking at the ones based in uh, North America. And that's the fatwa of, of Amja. So again, Shaykhana, we've spent more than an hour speaking. I want to now be very, very uh, clear here. And I'm gonna give you the position of one of my teachers and mentors. And if you feel uh, free to, to validate it or to reject it or to modify, tafaddal. But I know you're very cautious. I'm gonna tell you what one of my uh, esteemed uh, mentors says. And it is something that I, I feel comfortable saying now, even though I delayed this for the longest time. And that is that uh, there is no doubt that the, uh, the Islamic Sharia, compl the Sharia compliant uh, loans that are given are highly problematic. However, given the increasing need, given the situation of Muslims in this land, generally speaking, middle class, lower middle class, and of course anybody who's struggling, generally speaking, the hajjah is enough for them that they are allowed to avail themselves to these Islamic uh, alternatives, even though they are not 100% uh, permissible or 100% halal, let us say. But given the mitigating circumstances, we will say that we can overlook the problematic clauses and especially uh, those that are closer to the goals of the Sharia ah and have minimal clauses. And that is without mentioning the names of corporations, we don't want to do that. But uh, the one that is Al Musharak Al Mutanaqis or the diminishing partnership. That have Having been said, this isn't just an open license. Rather, we encourage uh, Muslim entrepreneurs and businessmen to think of models that are more uh, permissible, that are more halal. Uh, we also encourage the lay Muslim to think long and hard that we haven't even discussed the issue. Is it even wise from an economic perspective to lock oneself into a mortgage for 30 years or to pay rent? There are many economists, Muslims and non-Muslims, that are actually saying paying rent actually is better uh, for those, especially on the, you know, in, their, uh, in the beginning of their careers. They don't know where they're going to be going, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we don't want to just give a blanket endorsement. At the same time, insha'Allah ta'ala, for most average Muslims, it is permissible for them to purchase the house that they live in uh, using one of these uh, uh, Islamic uh, alternatives. And if they cannot find an Islamic alternative, these corporations are not uh, accessible to them or they're not able to get a loan from them, and their situation is not necessarily darura, but dire, let's say. I think Amja has that for the phrase haja masa, I think, which is a new term that was there, but a, a strong haja, not necessarily darura. In that situation, perhaps even if they cannot find uh, a Sharia compliant one, they might be allowed to even think of a conventional one. This is what one of my uh, teachers has, has said. Would you allow me to say this or would you want to put a caveat? Because I know you're very hesitant to, to, <laughs> to say explicitly. So what is your position, Sheikhna? Uh, you know, because of, the, because of my reluctance and because of my hesitation to uh, basically to have my own individual position, I, I just hide behind the Amjad's position. Uh, and I think that Amjad's position is not really far away from what you said. I, I said so, you know, the, the, the only thing is that the person who is not able to find an alternative, I would say, ask the scholars that you trust um, uh, to find, I'm sorry, the person who's not able to find an Islamic alternative and feels that his haja is such that, uh, that a conventional one would be permitted for them. I would, I would tell them, ask the scholars that you trust uh, their judgment, that you trust their piety and trust their judgment. Um, and it doesn't have to be one scholar, ask, you know, a couple of scholars, but both, but both or all are trustworthy and you trust their deen and you trust their knowledge. 
and uh, it is okay to take the easier position if you uh, if you feel that you have yeah okay I, I can add that caveat Sheikh, and no problem we 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 mandate on the person to uh, get a specific fatwa for themselves you're right about this so we i can add that so uh, that is definitely. Yeah, defin then I'm in. This, then we are in complete agreement. Okay. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So, inshallah, with that, Sheikhna, final uh, uh, concluding thoughts. We we spent a lot of time. Alhamdulillah, we concluded on a very specific note here. Um, any concluding thoughts from you? Any general nasiha and advice about this topic for our uh, for our viewers? Well, I advise myself and uh, all the Muslims to think good of the Muslims, to think good of the efforts, uh, you know, that are being done uh, by, you know, uh, well-meaning uh, Muslims. And uh, we're not angels. And uh, no one is saying that uh, we are angels. No one, is, no one is saying that the Muslim financiers are angels. Uh, we make dua for them. Uh, we uh, certainly advise them and we... Uh, advocate for the Muslim customers and advise them as much as we can, but we also make the offer them because we know that things are not easy. Uh, we know that they encounter many difficulties and it is not always because uh, they want to make more money. It is oftentimes uh, because the, the, the circumstances, the laws, um, the sort of the financial environment around them does not allow them to do better. Uh, we still want them to do better, but we also want to patronize them uh, so that they can basically develop, they can grow, uh, they can reach the size where they can have the, the capacity uh, to improve their contracts and to provide better products, uh, better financial products to the Muslims. And I, I say to the Muslims that we are in this predicament because of our condition, our condition as an ummah. And uh, reality is rational. Reality is rational. Let's not blame anyone but ourselves uh, for our condition. Uh, reality is rational, and you can't change it unless you are rational uh, as well. So let's keep our heads down, keep working, keep improving uh, you know, ourselves, our families, our communities, our ummah, and humanity at large. So. Uh, just a sincere, consistent effort uh, from each and every one of us will, inshallah, uh, improve and change our reality. Alhamdulillah. Jazakumullah khair, Shaykhna. We had a very, very uh, amazing, interesting conversation. I hope it was of benefit uh, to our viewers. Uh, and Shaykhna, this inshallah is not going to be the last time we, we have a back and forth. This is the first time we had one, but I hope inshallah we can do multiple sessions. Uh, definitely um, the, uh, for our viewers here, the Shaykh's PhD uh, was about medical issues and Islamic fiqh. So we definitely have to talk a, a lot about uh, the, the changing understandings of medicine and how they're going to impact uh, fiqh. He is a practicing doctor. And and uh, practicing Sheikh as well. Waqalilu mahum, alhamdulillah. So, inshallah, this is round one with our Sheikh. Inshallah, we're going to try to have other uh, rounds as well. Jazakumullah uh, khair. We hope, inshallah, ta'ala, that you benefited uh, from uh, this uh, rather long and yet uh, technical and yet also, inshallah, ta'ala, very useful uh, talk. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to uh, grant Dr. Hatim a uh, long life full of piety and good deeds and good health. We ask Allah for afia for him and his loved one, and for us and our loved ones. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to accept all that we do to forgive our shortcomings, to exalt our ranks, and to ask and to cause us to die upon the kalima of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In al Muslimin, wal Muslimat, wal Mu'minin, wal Mu'minat, wal Qanitin, wal Qanitat, wal Sadiqin, wal Sadiqat, wal Sabirin, wal Sabirat, wal Khashiin, wal Khashiat, wal Khashiin, wal Khashiat, wal Mutasaddiqin, wal Mutasaddiqat, wal والصائمات والحافظين فروجهم والحافظات والذاكرين الله كثيرا والذاكرات أعد الله لهم مغفرة وأجرا عظيما